Hi, and welcome to Vietnam Wind Power Virtual. I'm Alyssa Peck. I'm Chief of Staff here at the Global Wind Energy Council, and I'll be your MC and guide over these next two days of virtual events, packed full of panel discussions, keynote speeches, and opportunities for you to network and to power Vietnam's wind energy growth. Of course, this event was originally supposed to take place in Hanoi uh, physically, but due to COVID-19, we've actually postponed that event to November. And while we still hope that all of you can join us in November in Hanoi, we are really thrilled to see such a huge interest and turnout for this virtual event. And we'd like to thank all of our sponsors, um, event supporters, and of course, all these attendees and, uh, and people working on the ground to develop Vietnam's wind power growth. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a couple things about how to use this virtual platform uh, in order for you to make the most of your event experience. So right now, when you've joined, you're actually on the stage area. The stage is where all the opening remarks are going to take place um, for both days of the event. Then we'll move to the sessions area where the panel discussions and business matchmaking session will take place. So if you look to the left side of your screen, you'll see the hop in uh, toolbar with all the different areas uh, of the virtual platform. So if you click onto the sessions area, um, you'll see all the different panel discussions and the business matchmaking sessions there. And those will be live uh, during their scheduled times. Uh, if you have any questions for our panelists, um, you can always submit them in the chat box and we'll be moderating uh, the chat and passing all questions on to the moderator during the panel discussions. There will be also lots of opportunities to network and meet new people uh, throughout these two days, also interested in Vietnam's wind market. If you look to the right side of your screen in the chat area, you'll also see a people's tab. So here you can actually search uh, for everyone who's registered and attending uh, Vietnam Wind Power Virtual. Um, you can search by their name, company name, and you can chat uh, individually. You can also invite people to video chat so you can actually speak face to face. And then you can also um, connect offline. Um, many people have their LinkedIn profile, um, as well as you can see everyone you've been connected with in your Hopin account. Another way you can network is in the networking area. So during the scheduled networking times that we have uh, during this program, we'll be opening that area. And we encourage you to go there to quickly meet a lot of new connections um, and expand your network. So basically this area is going to be like a speed networking. So you'll be randomly uh, matched with someone who's based on your profile and you'll have two minutes to introduce yourselves, connect, exchange information, and then uh, your time will run out and you can be matched with a new person. Uh, again, if you didn't have the time to, to connect or you forget someone's name, just go to your Hopin account uh, profile and you'll be able to see everyone you've connected with there. The last way that you can network with people is in the expo area where we have virtual booths of all of our event sponsors and the local Vietnamese developers who are participating in the business matchmaking session. So we would encourage you to also check out that area during the scheduled networking breaks and to meet and chat with the booth reps um, and, and make connections that way as well. Finally, if you have any questions throughout the event, um, technical or otherwise, please do not hesitate to reach out to the organizers via the chat and we'll do our best to help you out. With that being said, let's kick off day one of Vietnam Wind Power Virtual uh, with GWEC's very own CEO, Ben Backwell. Over to you, Ben. Hello, everyone. My name is Ben Backwell, and I'm the CEO of the Global Wind Energy Council. I want to welcome you all to Vietnam Wind Power 2020. This is the first time GWEC has held Vietnam Wind Power virtually, and we're excited about using technology to be in close contact with all our friends and colleagues in Vietnam. Having said that, I hope it's not too long before I can once again visit Vietnam and see you all in person. I wanna say some words about the COVID-19 crisis, which has affected us all so profoundly around the world, and in particular about its effects on the energy sector. Now, firstly, COVID has had a profound effect on world energy demand. 
And it's really been the old fossil fuel energy industries which have been most affected till now. The figures from the International Energy Agency show massive reductions in demand for oil, coal and gas in 2020, while renewable energy will still so show some continued growth. And meanwhile, global carbon emissions are on track to show their biggest year-on-year -year reduction since the Second World War, effectively reversing the increases of the last decade. Now, this is nothing to celebrate in my view as it comes as a result of tragic loss of life and suffering and a crushing reduction in economic activity. Nor can we be complacent as COVID-19 has created multiple challenges for the wind and renewables industries, including disruptions to the supply chain and project construction. And this has seen GWEC reduce its forecast for 2020 by almost 20%. These challenges are not gonna disappear anytime soon as we face up to the effects of economic recession and lower power prices in different markets. However, the events of the last six months do present us with an opportunity. Governments will now move quickly to rebuild economies through economic stimulus packages and other measures, and tens of trillions of dollars will be pumped into different national economies over the coming few years. And at the same time, people and communities are determined to build back better and create economies and societies that are more sustainable, healthier and fairer. The energy technologies of the past were already under pressure due to unsustainable business models and falling competitiveness. We must resist pressure to try and revive these failing industries as this will just set us up for further crises in the future. And I want to make a special mention of the importance of building back better for young people around the world. It will be young people, after all, who will bear the burden of debt for decades to come as a result of government stimulus. And so it's important that we now take this chance to build a world that's worth believing in for them. At GWEP, we are convinced that wind energy can play a strong part in contributing to economic recovery from COVID. Building wind energy at the right pace to meet the requirements of the IPCC to stop catastrophic global warming means completely renewing the world's power infrastructure. And this will require trillions in investment and create millions of jobs. The community of companies and associations that GWEC represents is keen to bring this investment capacity to bear sooner rather than later. Front-ending projects, and investments which will then help economic recovery to happen faster. And to be clear, as an industry, we are not asking for handouts or bailouts. What we're asking for is simply the right conditions to be in place in order to be able to ramp up and increase investment. This means working with governments to create sensible market design and transparent regulatory systems so that we can deploy more capacity quicker. That's why in May, the CEOs of the major wind energy manufacturers and producers of the world wrote to world leaders to state our commitment to creating a sustainable economic recovery. From 2015 to 2019 alone, the wind industry invested over $652 billion in building sustainable power systems. And now our industry is pledging to create an additional investment of at least $207 billion per year, or over two trillion up to, two, up to 2030, as well as triple the amount of jobs in the wind sector from 1.2 million at present to over 4 million. Now, let me finish by turning to Vietnam. As you know, GWEC has been working to help develop Vietnam's excellent wind resources for something like five years now. And in those years, it's been really exciting to see the remarkable progress that the country has been making in building a renewables industry backed by ever stronger ambition from the government as it seeks to move away from coal towards a sustainable energy system that can be a partner for continuing dynamic economic growth. Since 2016, the National Power Development Plan has incorporated more and more renewables and wind energy. And we now have more than two gigawatts of approved wind projects under PDP7. Current policy alone could see six gigawatts of wind power installed by 2030, 
and we're excited at the prospect of even more ambitious targets in PDP-8. We're convinced that Vietnam, with its strong and diverse natural resources and vibrant communities, has almost perfect conditions to continue to grow and attract investment into its wider economy by basing its energy system on wind and other renewables. And this in turn will create skilled, sustainable jobs, maintain a livable and healthy environment for Vietnam's population and help Vietnam show leadership within the wider Southeast Asia region. At GWEC, we're excited to be undertaking this journey with you. And I hope the discussions over the next couple of days will help us take further practical steps to develop Vietnam's vision further. Once again, welcome. Thank you so much, Ben. And indeed, uh, green recovery is more important than ever given the current climate and wind power can play a huge role in driving through uh, green recovery globally. Next, we have uh, opening remarks from Carl Samit Mampel, who is head of energy at the COP26 Clim Climate Action Champions. And he is going to provide an overview of how Vietnam is a leader of the sustainable energy transition in Southeast Asia. Over to you, Carl. Good afternoon. It's great to be here virtually with you all at Vietnam Wind Power. The 26th Conference of the Parties, or COP26, under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change will be taking place in the UK in November next year. As preparation, countries will be strengthening their national commitments under the Paris Agreement to keep temperature rises to well below 2 degrees and ideally 1.5 degrees. In parallel, momentum is building globally around the sustainable energy transition. The opportunity is clear. The cost of renewable power is falling rapidly. For example, onshore wind in Vietnam is expected to be cheaper than new coal by next year, according to Carbon Tracker. Clean power is a growing industry which provides good quality jobs and supports economic development. The region could see a ninefold increase in renewables jobs through the energy transition to 2050, according to IRENA. Clean power reduces the need for fo expensive fossil fuel imports, supporting energy security, and is good for public health, avoiding the air pollution impacts of burning coal. The global low carbon transition will need a radical level of collaboration from all corners of our world. Last week, we saw a thousand businesses, as well as countries, cities, regions and investors, commit to net zero emissions by 2050 through the Global Climate Ambition Alliance. This coalition accounts for 25% of global CO2 emissions and 50% of global GDP, so momentum is truly building. Post-COVID-19, we also have an opportunity for a green recovery to cement these benefits of a low carbon economy and increase resilience going forwards. In Vietnam, some good progress on renewable energy has been made, and for this, I offer congratulations. Total renewable capacity, including hydro, is the largest in the region, and wind power capacity increased 50% in 2019. Vietnam has been recognized internationally as a renewables market of interest and with the potential to be a leader of the sustainable energy transition in Southeast Asia. Further developments can make this a reality. In order to be able to best take advantage of the clean energy opportunity in Vietnam, international experience has shown that 1. Setting ambitious renewable energy goals and integrating them into power development plans provides market certainty and direction. Two. Policy stability and clarity are important enablers for renewable energy investment. And three, bankability of power purchase agreements is key for financing renewables projects. In this context, I hope that the Vietnamese government and regulators will continue their good work to build a stronger legal and policy framework to accelerate the benefits of renewable energy. It is encouraging to see that Vietnam has a renewable energy goal, which could be increased in the coming months. It is also good to see that proposals are being considered to increase policy stability by extending the current feed-in tariff to 2023. Policy clarity could also be strengthened around the transition period to any future renewables auctions in due course. Finally, whilst recent model PPA revisions have been helpful, further improvements could be made to attract more international developers and investors to Vietnam. Furthermore, there is also opportunity for Vietnam to take a regional leadership role in phasing out coal power. This would free the country from volatile prices of imported fossil fuels, avoid the risk of stranded coal assets, and gain the health benefits of clean energy. Just imagine what investments could be made if funds for coal imports can be substituted to more productive uses. Taking a leadership role by minimising coal in the next power development plan would enable Vietnam to be a beacon for the region 
and attract investment in energy projects and from manufacturing companies that want to produce their merchandise with renewable energy only. Globally, we are in a race to a zero carbon economy. Vietnam can be part of this race and be a leader of the sustainable energy transition in the region with further plans to shift to renewables and away from coal. Wind power overall has a great potential to contribute to meeting Vietnam's growing energy demand and provide green growth and jobs, including through the supply chain. And offshore wind in particular offers an opportunity to develop at the scale for baseload. Vietnam's current role as chair of ASEAN offers a further opportunity for regional leadership, building on its engagement to date on sustainable energy in this forum. Vietnam can be the exemplar in the region where many countries look to it, given its strong economic growth and progress on, reno on renewable energy, and who will want to see whether it can meet its continued energy demand growth through clean means. To finish, the successful development of Vietnam's wind resource is a collaborative effort between government, industry, and the international community. In the run-up to COP26, keep up the good work in jointly developing the wind energy industry in Vietnam. I'm sure Vietnam Wind Power can make an important contribution over the coming days. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much, Carl. And now we have our last keynote of day one. Um, this will be about the global impacts of COVID-19. And we're lucky to have Tom Harries, who is the head of wind research at Bloomberg NEF, uh, who will provide some insights. Over to you, Tom. Hi, my name is Tom Harris, and I lead the global wind research team at Bloomberg NEF, or BNEF. And we cover both onshore and offshore across most of the value chain. Today, I'm going to talk to you about our installation forecasts, which account for the impact of COVID-19. Now, to start off with, here's a chart which shows two different forecasts. One we put together in December 2019, which is pre-pandemic in the gray. And then the blue one is the forecast we put together in March this year, which includes the impact of the pandemic. Now, the major differences here is that we expect 2020 now to be a lower year but with that capacity shifting into 2021, making 2021 a bigger year than we originally expected pre-pandemic. Beyond 2021, we expect the impact to be fairly limited. And these numbers cover onshore and offshore wind. But when thinking about the pandemic, we have to put a, um, a ring around exactly how we think it might pan out when thinking about different scenarios. So we've got three different scenarios we use at BNF. The first is a single wave pandemic, which expects global growth to return by 4Q 2020. Scenario two is a multi-wave pandemic, where we expect growth to return in 2Q 2021. And then a third scenario, which is an enduring pandemic, which expects growth to return in 4Q 2021. Now these get more severe as you go from one to three, but most of what I'm gonna show you in this presentation focuses on the impact or the scenario of a single wave pandemic. So our top level numbers for the forecast, assuming a single wave pandemic globally, again, just to reiterate shows, installations now rising in 2021, as opposed to the big year in 2020 that we originally expected. But importantly here is the impact of offshore wind. So in 2020, we can see that offshore is below 10% of the overall market. But by 2025, it's going to be between 20 to 2020 uh, to 25% in our view. So a growing share of the market for offshore wind. When discussing our forecast, I just want to show you some of the layers that, that go into this. And, and the three main ones are the project pipeline, policy, and economics. So the pipeline essentially looks at the tens of thousands of wind projects that we keep up to date at BNF, looks at the status of the project, looks at the developer of the project and tries to put a view on the viability of the project and its likely timeline. Then we layer on policy, which takes into account any, any government policy that might incentivize or disincentivize wind build in a given country. And then we look at the economics, the merchant economics of wind in a given country or market to try to understand could wind projects stand on their own two feet based on market prices and the cost of wind in a given market and therefore not rely on government subsidies, which could prop up our medium to longer term forecast. So with that in mind, we then started to look at, okay, with those layers, plus what happens in COVID-19, the first thing we looked at was what's happening to projects 
under construction today, what's happening to factories, the supply chain, and what's happening to auction schedules. So this matrix is designed to capture those three categories in the, in the, in the columns, and then the rows show the different countries. So yellow here is essentially carrying on, but with some disruption. Orange, partially banned or postponed, and red means no. So red means no factories open, or red means construction has stopped. Yellow means open or construction is carrying on, but with some disruption. So you can see that this is across solar and wind. You can see that broadly speaking, there's a lot of yellow, which means things have, have been carrying on fairly, fairly normal. And this was as of mid-April. So, so bang in the middle of some of the, 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 uh, the outbreaks in Europe and the US in particular. If you roll on to this matrix that we conducted in mid-May recently, you can see there's even more yellow now. And this is to show that some of the initial impacts on factories and construction have, have, have been mitigated or has been allevi alleviated. And then auctions, we're seeing very little, very little indication of cancellations, just some postponements, but some carrying on as usual. Um, so this is all very positive to show that there are some impacts, but generally it's not about cancellations or severe closures or severe halting of construction. It's more, it's more about continuing, but with disruption. When looking at the supply chain, this is a chart accurate as of the end of April. We looked at where Blade and the cell facilities are. So here's a global map with triangles showing Blade facilities, circles in the cell facilities, green for open and red for closed. And again, as of the end of April, the majority of these factories are still open, aside from a pocket in India, which are closed, and a few in Latin America and the US. So the supply team is still open, albeit at maybe lower capacity, given stricter health and safety standards and distancing rules, uh, but kit was still being manufactured, turbines were still being made. The challenge became then less about can you manufacture the kit, but can you deliver it to the country and then onto the project on time and as scheduled. So taking that in, into consideration, we've got a, a delay to construction or some delay, which is, which is largely due to um, the difficulty in getting personnel on site because they cross many borders a lot of the time and some of the more specialized staff needed towards the end of commissioning a project are also typically traveling from country to country for the final stages. They're being held in, at borders and so on, which is delaying in some construction. Then we've got the supply chain issues we mentioned. So do, in order to understand what, they, what impact they could have on a typical construction timeline, we needed to understand what a, a typical timeline looked like. So this chart shows you for all projects since 2017 in all these markets, how many days per turbine it took to install and commission the wind farm. So the way we come up with that metric is we said, okay, what is the number of days between financial close and full project commissioning? And how many turbines are on that project? And you divide the two. And the idea here is to show that in some markets, they're more efficient at installing wind farms than in others when you take into consideration the size of projects. So, that, so when you come up with a typical idea of a timeline, what I'm trying to say here is that it is dependent on the market. So that was a days per turbine metric. If you look at it in pure months, so how many months does it take to construct and commission a wind farm in these different countries? This, of course, assume takes into consideration the, the standard or typical project size. So in some countries that build bigger projects, they might take slightly longer in month, in month terms, places like Brazil, for example, whereas in Germany, they build much smaller projects, so they take less time. But on the days per turbine, they might differ. But if you look at this chart, the idea is to show blue is a typical timeline, pre-pandemic. Then we, then we thought, okay, what sort of delays could you put on to the typical timeline as a result of different scenarios of the pandemic? We said in scenario one, a single wave, you're looking at a two to three months delay. Then an additional delay for scenario two, and then an additional delay for scenario three. But those incremental delays from scenarios one to three get smaller. The reason being is we think the initial disruption to business as usual causes the biggest distress to a project timeline as new health and safety practices are adopted, distancing rules are adopted, border controls come into effect. That's why purple is bigger than green and yellow, where we think by, by scenarios two and three, developers are very aware of what's going on 
um, and I've already accommodated for most of um, disruption. And then thinking further ahead, the long-term fundamentals of renewables and, and wind are still strong, irrespective of the COVID-19 outbreak. So to give you one example, here's a list of EU member states and essentially comparing where they are today in terms of renewable energy penetration on final consumption, energy consumption, and against the electricity sector, where they are today against where they want to be in 2030. And needless to say, all the purples are negative, which means there's a gap to the target, which means they are looking to further decarbonize and essentially just trying to show here that the, those longer term fundamentals of an energy transition are still there, irrespective of the, of the outbreak. Then moving on to economics. So, so onshore wind prices, and, and here we've levelized prices. So each one of these dots is a project color coded by country. Um, so essentially the, the, the average tariff over a project's lifetime has started to come down. And we started to see some convergence in onshore wind around the sort of 20 to $50 per megawatt hour mark. And this is, this is to show that as prices comes down, the, the burden on government budgets fall. So less money is needed to support more capacity and therefore wind becomes even more attractive to governments, both in established markets and new markets when looking to, to add clean forms of generation. Similar chart for, for offshore wind, looking across a bigger time horizon here. But again, prices have come down fairly rapidly over the last five to 10 years, looking back five years and looking ahead five years. And you can see now by 2025, we're seeing a real convergence now of sub $100 per megawatt hour offshore wind prices. We're actually now starting to converge around the $50 to $70 per megawatt hour mark. So offshore wind is getting cheaper. One interesting impact of COVID-19 on, on wind or its potential impact is on financing activity. So given the current environment we're in, there is some concern that access to finance is slightly more difficult and the cost of finance is slightly higher. Now, with that in mind, we wanted to see, okay, well, how much capacity here is at risk? And figured out that actually offshore wind looks more resilient than onshore wind in the current crisis when it comes to financing activity. So these charts essentially take our forecast for onshore and offshore wind and convert that forecast into project status, and green being financed capacity. So if you look at onshore wind, you can see the majority of capacity we expect to come online this year has already been financed. But the majority from then on, from 2021, has not been financed. In offshore, it's different. The majority of capacity as far out as 2022 has already been financed. So any, any shortage of activity or reduced activity in financing at the moment in COVID-19 environment should have less of an effect on offshore wind than onshore wind in the short term. To give you an example of this, on the left-hand side is a layer cake of the all-in cost of debt for typical wind projects in Europe. And I'm not going to explain all the different layers. The point I'm trying to make is the cost of debt has fallen fairly rapidly over the last 10 years, as it were. But you can see a slight uptick now in 2020. And the idea here is that some of the bank, the margins the banks are offering have, have increased, which is increasing the order cost of debt. And that's largely on the back of the refinancing cost of banks themselves. With this increase in the order cost of debt of around 25 to 100 basis points, that results in either a project needing to reduce costs to maintain the given PPA and equity return expectation, or for a given higher cost of debt, given cost base, and a given return expectation, the PPA price will have to increase. So we're either gonna see maybe slightly higher prices in the short term for PPAs, or we could see sponsors or equity holders take a bit of a hit. And this brings me back to the numbers I showed at the start. So hopefully now these make more sense with respect to 2020 seeing a slippage of capacity into 2021. Just to hone in on a couple of regions, here, here are our Asian numbers or APAC numbers for onshore wind. Needless to say, China is a, is a dominant player here and India up to 2025. But that gray section for other APAC, which includes places like Vietnam and other Southeast Asian markets, is starting to grow. So we're starting to see a bit more diversification 
of wind energy and installations around APAC out till 2025. And finally, our offshore wind forecast. So you can see here, 2020 is a low year. This was already a low year pre-pandemic, and we haven't changed that. It was a low year of installations for no reason other than the offshore sector is fairly lumpy, and so there's big projects from year to year. Happens to be fewer big projects in 2020. I think that's largely due to, some, so to a, um, a bit of a lack of overlap between 2020 and 2030 renewable targets and subsidies, which have left sort of 2020 in the dark a little bit. Um, but after 2020, we are expecting growth in the sector, reaching plus 20 gigawatts of annual installations by 2030. What I want you to take away from this is the regional breakdown. So you can see the red, which is APAC. In the early 2020s, we were expecting a very busy time of construction and commissioning of projects in APAC versus the rest of the world. But then eventually, as we come to the mid 2020s and the later 2020s, we expect most of the activity to return to Europe. So a bit of a swing in terms of the regional dynamics, which would impact uh, both the supply chain, investors, and developers. I hope that was interesting. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Tom, for that really interesting presentation. And that wraps up the opening remarks uh, for day one. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we'll now head over to the sessions area uh, for the next panel discussion, which is Vietnam's Wind Energy Development Forum. Um, so I would encourage everyone to now move over to that session, which will be starting uh, very shortly, um, and join us there. If you have any questions, again, please do not hesitate to reach out in the chat and we can help guide you there. So I'll, I'll meet you over in the next session.